and I want to take a look at these types of pseudoscience, these types of superstitions, and I want to see what works, what doesn't, how you test these things. Um, so today we have an expert in here who's going to talk to us. His name is Matt Thornton. Just a brief bio on here. He was one of the first crop of Americans to be involved in the art and one of the first Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu black belts. And they'll talk a little bit about what jiu-jitsu is and what MMA is and boxing and other delivery mechanisms as well as a, a corrective mechanism, a way to figure out what works and what doesn't. And do you want to join a martial art or do you want to have kids or cousins or what have you? He wrote a, uh, he did a best-selling video series. It's a top seller. He's uh, trained some of the best black belts, literally in the world, on the planet. Um, you can see his bio here. So he's been addressing superstition as it relates to the field of sports training, combat sports, and martial arts. And he developed the methodology known as aliveness. Uh, Designed as a tool to help people distinguish fact and fiction, and that's been a major, that's played a major role in my intellectual work in my intellectual life. Uh, and you could read about that more if you want to, who the people he's trained. And he has schools all over planet Earth. So he's going to talk to us today. Give him a round of applause. Morning. 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 If anybody can't hear me, let me know. Uh, it's good to see you guys. I'm usually not up this early, so. Um, when I give this talk, usually what I do is talk a little bit about my take on martial arts. I've been doing. I started martial arts when I was a kid. Switched to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in, in 1992, 93, somewhere in there, when I was introduced to it by somebody named Jason Gracie, and. Uh, have been around MMA and martial arts for a long time. And my initial reason for entering in martial arts when I was young was the same reason most kids are attracted to martial arts. I want to learn how to fight and, and be a ninja. But uh, it wasn't because I wanted to be an MMA fighter. MMA didn't exist then. MMA didn't come into, a, into effect until I was already well into training. It was because I wanted to fight. And as I started to learn martial arts, it became pretty apparent to me that the vast majority of them are just pure bullshit. Just statistically about more or less every martial art you're going to list is pure bullshit. Whether it's Israeli commando fighting or Shaolin Kung Fu that's been around for thousands of years, or whatever, however it's, it's advertised, if it doesn't contain aliveness, which is something I'll talk about in a second, it will not, it will not work. And the reason why it won't work and why that conversation fits in really well with what he talks about in this class and critical thinking isn't because of the techniques. It's, it's because of the training method. So just like with critical thinking, what's super important, or science, what's very important isn't so much the answer you come to at any given moment in time. That might change based on the data. It's the way you drew the conclusion, and that, the methodology you use to arrive at your answer. And so it is with martial arts. It's about the training method. So the training method I talk about I call aliveness, which is composed of three key elements, timing, energy, and motion. Energy, I don't mean any hippie bullshit, I mean resistance. And timing, energy, and motion, resistance, those are the, those are the three uh, key components of a resisting opponent. And that resisting opponent, when we're talking about, comp I'm not, when I say competition now, I'm not necessarily talking about in an arena in front of an audience sport. I, I mean competition and there's somebody else that's trying to actually beat you or not let what you're trying to do work. They're actively opposing you. That um, competition factor is the connection between functional martial arts, science, critical thinking, and everything else in life that we care about when we care about the results, everything else that works. That's the component. So most martial arts, tradition, what I'll call traditional martial arts, I'm painting with a broad brush because I only have a short amount of time to talk to you, so, but uh, do not contain much resisting opponent practice. What they'll have is a form like what you saw the Kung Fu guys do, 
they repeat it over and over again, and then they'll practice in a choreographed manner where person A comes in, like in Aikido as an example. Person runs in and tries to chop you in the top of the head, and then you do your move. And as long as what you're doing is choreographed, and you know what the other person's gonna do, it's, it's in some sort of pattern, you can look really awesome. Like I could take, if that's movie fighting, I could take anybody here, a good stuntman can take you and make you look like Jackie Chan in a movie. And in an hour or two, just you can put on an awesome display of martial arts badasses. But that has no relationship to when somebody angry is actually trying to punch you in the face. And that's the problem. By contrast, any functional martial art, and all functional martial arts today are sport martial arts. Because, by, because people care about winning in sports, aliveness was never taken out. So you have judo, wrestling, which is a very functional martial art, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, boxing, Thai boxing, these kind, of, these kind of arts. With those arts, you're gonna, you're gonna learn the basic movement a few times, practice it, make sure you have, the, 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 have it down soundly, and then add progressive <coughs> resistance. Slowly but surely, uh, your training partner is gonna give you more and more resistance, and that resistance is not in a pattern, it's, it's not a combat, but actually somebody fighting you back. So Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from day one, I would, to give you an example, teach you the functional ways to escape somebody that's holding you down in a headlock on the ground. You practice it calmly until we can make sure that you know what you're doing in the sense that you can repeat the movements the way I told you to. And then I tell the person on top to try and hold you down. And they, if they're really big and really strong or a lot better than you and they just hold you down the whole time, then they're, they're kind of a dick and or a bad drink partner. So the goal is to hold you down so it's difficult and then progressively make it harder and harder for you. If you're both evenly matched, then that's great. Then you can go straight to it. And you do that hour upon hour upon hour, and after a while, you can escape people's headlocks. That's, that's, that's basically it. That's an alive training method. In a traditional martial art, they would take that, put that into a form, and you practice it over and over and over again. So that's the, that's the major distinction, and that's what I call aliveness. And the important part is people get caught up a lot in what style's better, isn't this, a deadly technique and they're, they're missing the entire point again it's not about the conclusion it's about the way you arrive at that conclusion and the key difference between really good fighters and people who don't know how to fight besides just the mechanics of the movement is timing and, uh, how many here are UFC fans okay, you're familiar with Conor McGregor he's one of our one of our fighters Conor throws the same jab and cross all his opponents throw but his timing and his distance is just Beautiful, and that's what makes the difference. Same thing with jujitsu. I, I my personal jujitsu game, doing jujitsu on the ground, which is a, kind of a form of wrestling. If you're not familiar with, is very simple. I, I don't do anything. Else. Yes, I'll be locked. It's very simple in terms of technique. You're not gonna. If you see me roll, you're not gonna see me do. I don't. I don't move fancy or fast. I'm not built for that. But. And, and so after one of my students or one of my training partners has been around and trained with me for a while, they usually know exactly what I'm going to try and do. It usually only takes a couple of weeks to figure out what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter if they haven't been trained for a long time. I will always beat them until they get better. And that's because of timing. It's just timing. I can, I'm a little bit ahead because I've been doing it for 20 years. And that's the difference in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu between somebody who's a really good competitive black belt and somebody that's a beginner or a blue belt. It's not about accumulation of technique. It's about timing. That timing is only acquired when you're dealing with a resisting opponent. You don't get timing from repeating a, a, a pattern over and over again. There's no timing there because there's, there's no feedback. There's nothing to time yourself off of. So when you take aliveness out, no matter how functional the movements are, they won't work. And that's what happened with traditional martial arts. They basically became like religion. They started with a conclusion. There's no real testing or resistance to it. They have a myth mythological story of how it was created. There's always a founder who could beat everybody up or throw them around and usually conveniently dead. And, um, and it just gets passed on generation upon generation exactly as it was before. It doesn't evolve. And that's the other thing. Anything alive is going to change and evolve over time because competitors battle with each other. There's a process. And you're developing new technology to try and win. So that's it. Um, I don't talk a lot about specific styles, so it, for example, when I mentioned Connor, is Connor a tie boxer? Is Connor a boxer? So, I mean, Connor's a striker. So striking, functional striking is a delivery system. If you, 
ball up your fist and you want to throw it in somebody's face really hard, we know how to do that. It's been around, boxing's been around for a long time. I mean, mechanically, we haven't figured out just like we know how to choke somebody. There is a right way to do it and there is a wrong way to do it. There's a better way to do it and a poorer way to do it. But the right way to do it mechanically transcends culture. Just like there's no such thing as Chinese geometry. Or I said, man, I have cancer. I need to go see a Tibetan oncologist. You know right away I'm an idiot. So if I go to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school in Singapore, or I go to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school in Australia, or wherever I go, opposite parts of the world, if it's a legitimate school, there'll be, of course, differences, but the foundation, foundational movements of what they're doing will be exactly the same. Because truth transcends culture. It's not bound by culture. And so when you really pair martial arts and fighting down to the core essentials of what works and what doesn't, what I call the delivery system, stand up clinching ground, there's no culture to it. It's not Japanese or Korean. It's striking. It's grappling. It's clinch. So that's another thing that you'll see in common with, uh, with martial arts. So early I have to have notes for myself. Um, so let me just list a few questions that always come up, give you some brief answers, and then I'll just open it up to the audience because I usually get a lot of questions when I do this. But one of the things I'll get quite a bit that's out there all the time is, well, that's, you're, that's a sport. MMA is a sport. Like, the pressure points are illegal, and, and uh, they're not training for the street. What about multiple opponents? What if the guy has a knife? And on and on it goes. And my answer to that is, yes, it's a sport, and it doesn't matter. I mean, there's a functional way, a best way, to take it back to my headlock example, to escape a headlock. It's a fixed position. So we figured that out you know, over the years. We know how to get out of there against somebody big and strong in the best way possible. It doesn't matter if that headlock occurs out in the parking lot or if it occurs on the mat in a competition. The escape doesn't change. There's no special street escape. It just doesn't exist. So those delivery systems that I say transcend culture, they also transcend environment. The training method transcends environment. If I go in and I'm training military personnel, or I'm training law enforcement, they have a different objective, but they need liveness just as much, if not more. So what we do is we find a way to bring that in and bring in that competitive process so they can start to acquire timing on whatever it is they're working, whether it's handcuffing or putting a, a, you know, taking somebody to the ground. So the street versus sport thing is really just a fallacy. Plus, just to be honest with you, not, nobody really, myself included, wants to get in a fight with a good MMA fight. They will beat you up. So it's not designed for street. It doesn't need to be designed for street. Because somebody like Connor or somebody like whoever, Gooney, Gunnar Nelson, another one of our guys, those skills that they have will transcend the environment. And we can talk more about self-defense if you want to. Because the part that's going to involve anything physical is so minuscule, it doesn't really matter. But that's the street versus sport thing. The other one is you can't just throw people into sparring, and that's true, and we don't. I have students uh, flashed up briefly on the screen, but one of my black belts, she's 64. She started training with me when she was 50, so she's been with me for 14 years. She was a judo black belt from Japan, but she'd never done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. She already had some good grappling though. There's a Chinese woman that grew up in Japan uh, named Lily Pagel. And I was given a seminar, and I actually watched her arm bar, you know, a, a fully resisting big, athletic guy, and I saw this 50-year-old woman, she weighs all of about, I think, 120 pounds, force this guy to actually submit, or she would break his arm. I'm like, she has some potential. I like her. <laughs> and um, she's been around. She's 63. She trains every day, 64, trains every day. Uh, lots of students in their 50s and 60s. The bottom line is, with a liveness like anything athletic, you have to train so that you don't get hurt. If you get hurt, it's counterproductive, so you train to the level that you can. And the key word in progressive resistance is progressive. I mean, I don't want to, if I was going to teach you striking, I wouldn't want to stick you in the cage or the ring and immediately have somebody just punch you in the face and then you become gun shy and scared as you should be because that's intelligent. And uh, it's hard then for me to proceed to teach you your skills. So I want to work you into it progressively. That's the smart way to do it. With jujitsu, it's easier because on the ground, you can start rolling day one. You don't really have to worry about getting hurt or punched in the face like you would with a striking order. But the methodology is the same. I mean, some of the people that come to my gym have been, haven't done anything athletic for 30 years. They've been sitting behind a desk since high school. They're totally out of shape. 
if I immediately just put them in the mat, even though I know they won't get hurt with one of my athletes and they train for 10 minutes and they go home that night and they wake up the next morning and they feel sore, they don't, look for, they don't know what that is. They think they caught a disease. They're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then they're gonna call up the gym and they're gonna put in a cancellation notice and they're not gonna tell me it's because they woke up sore, they're out of shape, their schedule changed or they have to move, or that, another reason. And so it's counterproductive for me and it's counterproductive for them because that's somebody that could really use what it is that we offer. And I weeded them out because I was essentially just looking for the strong. I mean, if I was running a competition team, that's what I would do. I would invite anybody, and in two weeks I'd have 10 guys left, and they would be the only people that could survive the cardio that I would put them through, and the hell that I would put them through, and I would teach them. But that's not my goal. My goal is to teach everybody. And so this idea that live training is violent or dangerous or rough, or there is anything out there that can't be trained alive because it's too deadly, that's just pure bullshit. So anytime you hear somebody throw that out there, just trust me, it's just pure bullshit. Anything can be trained alive if you're intelligent about it. And then the last thing I'll say is just, uh, I, I often get asked too about, probably not from this audience, but from some audiences, well, what about the spiritual benefits of martial arts? What about the, the philosophy of martial arts and all that kind of stuff? And my answer to that is always the same as well. If what you're doing is based on a falsehood, then the profound things that it might offer aren't going to be available to you. Everything profound has to start with the fact that it's actually true, in my opinion. So the positive benefits that come from training in <coughs> martial arts, or are available if that's what you're interested in, make themselves available to you to the point that you make yourself vulnerable. And you make yourself vulnerable by putting yourself in positions where you're vulnerable, which means against resisting opponents. You know, if you're not willing to tap, if you're not willing to be sore, if you're not willing to put in the hours, if you're not willing to train in a live manner, all this other stuff that people talk about that come with martial arts like self-esteem, better self-awareness, all of those benefits, they're not going to be there. You have to earn those. And so what you do has to be based in truth. So I actually think they actually have it backwards. If what you were really looking for was something profound from the martial arts, then you really want to focus on the sport, on the sport aspect, which doesn't necessarily mean to compete in front of other people but all the things that that brings, all the things that resisting fun brings to the table. So, um, I get, anybody have any questions? I think I did the best I could this morning. Explain that. Yes? I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, Krav Maga. I'll tell you a Krav Maga story. <laughs> For years, I've had people that would call up my academy and say, I'm taking the test, one of the higher level instructor tests down there in Los Angeles, very expensive, they have to pay a lot of money, and they go down there and they basically spar. And I need to get prepared for it. So I say, okay, come on. I've done it a couple times myself, now I just have some of my other coaches do it. So I tell them, okay, come on, bring, uh, come down to the gym, we'll help you out, basically charge them for privates. They're gonna be doing something that is like MMA, it's just bad MMA not very good at it, but they're going to try. And so I said, okay, tell me what are the parameters of this test that you have to take, they tell me. And I mimic the test in the cage. One of my, usually one of my beginning MMA fighters or athletes, somebody that hasn't been training with me very long, and they just get destroyed. Like somebody like one year of jujitsu, and it's just, they have no idea what they're doing. Going harder and more violent isn't a substitute for intelligent technique and a proper delivery system. And so, there's that, and they train with me, and they, they realize it right away, and they're like, oh man, I, I suck, and I'm like, well, let's just keep training. We usually train for a week or two weeks. They go down, and every single time, they ace the test. And they email me back how awesome it was, and they were at the top of their class, and I think, well, why, why are you training? You train with me two weeks, you're at the top of your class. But there is something about Israeli commando, or putting on fatigues, or secret Soviet training methods and shit like that that gets people excited. And so from a marketing standpoint, it's awesome. From a technical standpoint, it, when I look at it or other people look at it that know what I know, it just looks like bad MMA. Yes? You said that uh, strength was like the least important thing and that technique and timing were more important. I didn't actually say that, but I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. So it's like, it doesn't really no, well, strength is definitely part of the equation. Well, yeah, but yeah. like, in relation to the other... The other in part. relation to timing, no. 
Timing is the single most important thing in fighting, especially if we talk about on the ground. You can make up for bad timing, striking, if you're one of those people that can hit like George Foreman or Dan Henderson, because it's like one bad punch, you know, you can knock anybody out. That, that's there. But absent that kind of skill, which most people are, are born with or not, it's all time. So you said, so you said if you're looking for a martial arts gym, basically you have to be competing against somebody in your career, right? If you're looking for a, a gym, you want to go in and make sure you feel comfortable. Everybody's nice. Um, that's the most important thing. And then you're looking for a place that trains a lot. It doesn't have to be filled with competitors. Now I have, I have 12, I've created 12 Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts myself. 12, 12 as of now. And there's a couple of them that have never publicly competed. They've never entered a tournament. They're just, that's just not what they do. So one of my best coaches has never entered a Jiu Jitsu tournament, and I don't think he's ever gotten an airplane. He won't travel. He goes home, and then he comes to the gym. But anybody that walks through my door for the last 15 years, no matter who they are, how big they are, how strong they are, he will touch hands and roll with them, and usually wins. So he's good, but he just doesn't like the public thing. And I've seen that a few times. There's, I've had athletes before, this is not uncommon, that they'll go in the bathroom and projectile vomit for 45 minutes, and then start dry eating before every single competition. And you would think to yourself, after two or three years, that might go away, and it doesn't go away. That's just their response to competition. And I've had other athletes that I have to wake them up in the back taking a nap. <laughs> I took a guy to South Africa for a uh, makes martial arts fight there. This, is, this was a poorly organized event run by Hells Angels. It's a very stressful environment, right? It was segregated, the whole thing was weird, violent. The referee wasn't stopping fights when he should, it was dangerous. Wasn't happy with the whole thing. But I had one guy there who's just, just gnarly and I, he's gonna be fine. So I'm watching the whole thing, stressing me out. I realize he's about to come on. I go back, I had to wake him up. He was watching the whole thing, he just got bored, went in the back, took a nap. Came out, knocked the guy out. Went there. So people are different. So when I say competition, I don't want people to confuse that and say, well, I'm, I'm, you have to go train at an at a MMA gym. You have to go train where guys are fighting or women are fighting. You don't have to train with, that's not what I mean by competition. What I mean is a resisting opponent. Yes. Kind of an oddball question, but have you ever seen a martial art or martial art like capoeira used effectively in any kind of self-defense manner whatsoever? Well, self-defense, you'd have to see a video on a security camera or something. So no, I have seen it used in MMA on a, a couple of occasions where the other guy was just falling asleep and the guy got a lucky kick and knocked him out. Like anybody can get knocked out, but yeah, that's not. Standing on your hands is probably not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did it for a little while, it was fun, but I had the monster like, it's not really like, oh yeah, you can use this in that, but like, oh. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's the, the, that's a typical story. They have a creation in their hands were shackles, they had to learn how to fight by standing on their hands. It's some bullshit. <laughs> yes? What are your thoughts on uh, firearm control? Uh, Hanging out your own weapon? Yeah. Um, is that what you mean? Uh, I'm just curious as to do you have a different perspective because you're trained in a non uh, weapon? Well, I don't know how to say uh, No, I don't. You have your own control. It's the same. So, you know, we actually have a program that we use that was developed through my academy for law enforcement and military called the ISR. And um, it's alive. Some of the worst training in the world is what you get at the police academy. Because there's some fat karate guy that's been there for 30 years and is about to retire and teaches people wrist locks, which is a very poor way to get somebody into a car. It just makes people mad because it hurts and it doesn't give you control over the body. Um, or some ridiculous karate moves. You'd be surprised how many academies are still that way. It's only been the last really five to six years that they've been starting to turn over to a more functional as a younger generation came in that grew up with MMA to more functional curriculum. And so when we do things, when I'm working with law enforcement, I'm working, for example, one of the main things important for them is handgun retention, being able to hang on to their own weapon when you're trying to secure somebody. Can't, I can't think of a place where you need aliveness more than that. 
I don't want to create a handgun caught it and have them practice it without resistance over and over again. I want to put that rubber gun in their holster or their you know, unloaded firearm in that holster and have somebody try and grab it from them. So that the first time that actually happens isn't they don't experience it outside on the street. So the tricky part is getting around all the lawyers for the city who are afraid of lawsuits. But what works in our favor now is that every academy that switched to an alive curriculum tends to have less lawsuits for due to lethal force, which is really a no-brainer because if officers don't actually know what to do or what they're trained to do doesn't work, they're going to resort to more, just more violence. Right? If you don't know how to put a proper choke on somebody, then you just start to squeeze hard. So that's, that answer your question? So can you say a little bit, or maybe a little bit more, about how you're connecting this theory of aliveness and corrective mechanisms, and how you connect that with the scientific method and, and how science works? Sure. Um, Daniel Dennett has a term he calls uh, the opponent process, and that's what I'm talking about. So for example, if you guys go into hard sciences, you're going to put forward a hypothesis of your idea about what it is in the, the field that you specialize in. You're, you're trained specifically for a particular field. You put forward your, your idea, you conduct an experiment, you get the results, then you have to do what? Then you have to put it in front of peers who are worthy of your knowledge, who are equal to you, hopefully, in what you know, and they're going to try and tear it apart. They're going to try and tear your idea apart. They're going to try and prove you wrong. That's an opponent process. And through that process, you arrive at a conclusion. Imagine if we took all that out. That's what happens with traditional martial arts. That's what happens with religion. The opponent process is taken out. There's no back and forth. There's no repeated experiment. So the opponent process, is, does this answer your question? Yeah. The opponent process is the, the link and I always kind of knew that, but I remember actually specifically six or seven years ago, I was listening to a talk Daniel Dan was giving, and he talked about the opponent process, and it immediately clicked with me. That is what it is. There's always that opponent process. Yes? I think you touched on a little bit in that speech, but uh, you could talk about the uh, belting up in Jiu-Jitsu. Sure. So in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the belt system's based solely on performance. And that's what makes it valuable. It's, it can't be faked any more than you can fake being able to play the guitar or speak Spanish. Like if I came in here and said, I speak really good Spanish, and you speak fucking Spanish to me, <laughs> give you off. <laughs> so jujitsu is like that. You come in and say, yeah, oh, I've got a black belt jujitsu. I'm like, cool, hey, let's roll. And then you're like, oh, you're not <laughs> And that's because we can do it. You can just like we can speak Spanish and play the guitar. You can do it on, on day one. It's not like we're fighting, we're competitively wrestling with each other. So. That's what makes it valuable. So for somebody to, to go up and, and rank in the academy, <coughs> they have to be able to be competitive with the other people at that rank. So they're training and they're training, and after two or three or four years go by, they're able to, uh, to go back and forth with the other people in the room that have a blue belt on. They're a blue belt. And at some point, I or one of the other coaches will put them through a mini ritual that we have, and I'll give them a blue belt. And if they're not, they're not. So I've had people that have been with me for 14 years that are still the first belt. And I've seen others go from white to black in five or six years. Goonie Nelson, Goonie Nelson, the UFC fighters, one of those guys. It's like in five years, he was able to beat most black belts around the world. It just depends. But it's, it's an empirical measurement, which is why I like it. Yes? Do you encounter much resistance from other instruction? Uh, instructors or people who are into the kind of the woo-woo magic of martial arts because you're kind of exposing that for what it is? Never in person. <laughs> Only on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the internet. So, um, no. And that's really dramatically decreased just because of the popularity of mixed martial arts. Prior to the UFC, it was a whole different world. But now, you have a whole generation of, I mean, the UFC is how old now? 18 years ago? So most of you, for most of your life, a lot of you have seen around, right? So people have seen what it looks like when two people know what they're doing and they're trying to beat each other up. So it's a little harder to take seriously to challenge that. But even before that, that, they rarely showed up. For them to actually show up and try and put into practice what it is they were doing, they would have to be completely delusional. 
delusional, like the guy that thought he could knock people over. That's actually far more interesting to me, and, and I've been doing this for a long time, and I still don't understand what that's about. And even more interesting to me is the people that are falling over for him. What the fuck's that about? <laughs> it's a shared delusion, but it's a really powerful shared delusion. So, but I think those people are rare. Most of the people that do traditional martial arts kind of know what they do with bullshit. So they will talk a lot of shit to their students about this or that or how, how for the street and this and MMA, I would just stick my thumb in his eye and all this stuff. And then as soon as a you know guy with cauliflower ears and from the wrestling team shows up, he says, Hey, you're gonna take class? I'm like, oh, you know, we don't really train for that. You should go here. We're more just for the cultural aspects. So like, you don't have a sign on your door that says you're for the cultural aspects. You had a sign on your door that said this is just like a tea ceremony or a flower arranging, I'd be all cool with it, but you don't. But uh, <laughs> So they're duplicitous, but occasionally you'll get somebody that's totally delusional. And in that case, you know, half the time it's on a, it's only happened a few times they've come into my gym and actually like to try to do a challenge match or something. And halfway through the process, we're, my fighters are always being very gentle and you know trying to control them without hurting them in any way, shape, or form. We realize this guy might be mentally ill. And I don't want to have one of my fighters in there beating up a guy that's just mentally ill that came in off the streets. Like, I'm master of kung fu, and I want to fight you, and he just got out of the hospital. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Um, so, you talked about the police for a while, about like, their lack of proper training. What's used in the U.S. military right now? The U.S. military switched over, as far as I know, the Army anyway, switched over quite a while ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago. The Rangers were the first. They switched over to a very simplified form of program developed by the Gracie family. So it's Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Their curriculum is actually not bad. And the SEALs have always had good, good methods and followed things around. But, and a lot of the police, the, the methods are getting better too. I, I was painting with a broad brush, but if you were to rewind the clock 10 years ago, it was ridiculous. So it's there's this bureaucracy that the, that the officers who train and the kind of thing that I train have to deal with. The, the, imagine how frustrating it is try and push papers to, to just to be able to get somebody in the academy to actually have to work with resistance. Just imagine that. But that's that's what they have to deal with. Now let's actually try and hang on to our weapon against somebody who's fighting back before we give them a gun and stick them in the car. Uh, you can't do it if he gets hurt. He's going to sue the city. So you got to go through all this all this stuff. So it's very frustrating for them. But as, as the results have come in and the city planners and, and lawyers have seen that the lawsuits actually drop when people know what they're doing, um, it's become easier. Yes? So whenever I hear someone talk about uh, martial arts, they always mention Bruce Lee. Do you feel like Bruce Lee was sort of a big martial artist, or is this kind of like this about like, television? Well, I, I love Bruce Lee. When I was a kid and I first saw a Bruce Lee movie, that was one of the main things that made me want to do martial arts. I mean, it was awesome. And for his time, you have to remember, he died in 1973. So for his time, he was brilliant. I mean, he was he knew boxing was important. He was starting to figure out how important uh, grappling was because he had a, a, rank, a friendship with a guy named Judo Jean LaBelle, famous stuntman from LA who's always been a good grappler. And um, he was kind of moving towards MMA. But like you even see that in Enter the Dragon. He's got the gloves on, he finishes with an arm bar. So, you know, but then he died in 1973. I think the most functional thing he ran into during his lifetime was Thai boxers when he was in Thailand, which he wrote quite a bit about. It kind of blew him away how hard they kicked. But uh, he didn't have a chance to see that, where it would go. Anything else? Yes? Um, you were mentioning how long it takes for somebody who's just a natural for a uh, black belt for the youth. How does that relate to other martial arts such as? Taekwondo, Those are two very different things. So with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the belt system is based on performance, and it's an empirical, measurable performance. And Judo can or can be the same way. Judo's a real sport. I mean, a, good, a, a legitimate Judo player can throw you on your head. And so and a lot of times their rank is attached to uh, tournaments. Taekwondo's bullshit. So I mean, you could go get a black belt at 12, you could have a black belt in Taekwondo after two years. 
So that's just a debt. And, and I'm sure somewhere there's a Taekwondo school that does something realistic and it looks like bad MMA, but that's not the one I'm talking about. So they're very different. And um, just to correct you on one thing, not correct you, but give you my opinion, because I hear this a lot. You, you heard the, the heavy set electrical man, whatever, say, you know, natural athlete. There's no such thing as a natural athlete. I've been training athletes for 25 years. There's no such thing as an athlete. Right? The least important thing, with, with especially if we're talking about top-level fighters, the least important thing is their physicality. Like the strong, fast people are a dime a dozen. The kicks and says you can pull them off trees. They grow like coconuts. They're everywhere. Strong, fast people who can stay calm under pressure and have the mental capacity to apply something technical like what we do against somebody who's really fighting back, very rare. So if there's anything that I look for, it's more mental. Um, can you speak to the mechanics of the uh, pressure Water. points? Can you speak to the uh, mechanics of pressure points and how those work? Because I hear people like in martial arts and they talk about like, oh yeah, I can like press on one point on your arm and your entire body goes numb. Well, that's you total bullshit. <laughs> Totally like how do like actual pressure points? Because you mentioned that there's no such thing as a pressure point. Right? <laughs> you can you can if you poke somebody in the eye, that'll work. If you hit them really hard in the back of the head, that'll make their vision blurry and fuck up their brain, which is why that's illegal in boxing. If you kick somebody in the nuts super hard, that hurts. <laughs> but like a poking in the arm or the armpit or here, or like you know, this karate chop to the neck, and it that's all just bullshit. Hundred percent bullshit. <laughs> Liver kicks can be nasty. But that's not a pressure point. That's a, like an internal organ that's getting damaged. You're going to make you blood the next time. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. It's not a good measurement for fighting. It, my answer when it comes to striking for me is actually pretty simple. If you've sorted out some amazing way to punch somebody, there is a sport that will pay you millions of dollars to do it. It's called boxing. Get in there and check it out. Or just like takedowns. So it's odd. These Chinese Kung Fu guys, they have these amazing takedowns. Let them come down to the university. Go down to the university. There's a whole bunch of guys who would love to see that. They'll use it if it works next season. They're going up against Oregon State or something. This is some Chinese state down. I don't give a fuck where it came from. It gives them a competitive advantage. They'll do it. <coughs> Never happens. Never happens. So, you know, uh, so essentially, martial arts don't involve to like, incorporate different. I keep an open mind. If I see something, if I ever see anything from anywhere, I don't care where it comes from, that I think is going to be functional or that one of, one of my athletes could use, I will definitely try it. Adopted, but I am extremely skeptical at this point that we're going to discover a new form of delivery system. I mean, uh, striking at this point with martial arts and the, the age of the internet and everybody having access to every part of the world and cell phones and all that kind of stuff, we're not so much talking about more width, we're talking about more depth in training. So the evolution occurs in depth, not width, not the accumulation of more weird things from other places but better and better ways to train and better and better ways to do what we already know how to do, which are the fundamentals of the fighting delivery system. Having said that, I still keep an open mind in case all of a sudden some ancient tribe in Africa had some strike that we've seen before. I'll, I'll look at it, but I'm not, not I would bet on it. Yes? Sistema is even worse than Problem on Sistema is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. This is what you guys should you guys should uh, <coughs> video that. Just go into YouTube and type in Sistema, and you will see what I'm talking about. If you attach, if you wear camouflage fatigues and attach Soviet, you 
could make millions of dollars teaching the craziest shit. <laughs> Just YouTube. <laughs> Just YouTube. So there you go. And he met, that guy's a multi, multi millionaire. Just with the last comment you made about uh, width and not depth. Um, so with some of the new jujitsu practices like Tenth Planet or Chaptera, um, what do you think about them? Do you think that they're taking it too wide versus some of the really that's a different types of modern jujitsu? <coughs> that, that's a that's a that's a different, more technical conversation about coaching. But I'll, I'll answer um, briefly because most people probably already know what we're talking about. But my um, personal model for teaching is that it's very important for me to talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu only for learning. It's very important for me in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to only teach the fundamentals of my classes to my students. And then as the stuff that I think everybody needs to know how to do to play the sport, and then let them develop their own style. Because I've never seen two competitive black belts ever that have played the same game, ever. You know, even by the time they get to purple or brown belt, they're totally different. And that difference is more based, in, in my opinion, having observed this process for a long time, in their personality than it is their build or uh, you know, how, how old they are. It's their personality. If they're an aggressive, extroverted person, they'll play that kind of game. Other people are more reserved and counter fighters, so forth and so on. If I interfere with that process as a coach by trying to develop their style for them, I believe I take away, I, I, I lengthen their learning curve. So by trying to impose your own style, you're Exactly. And a lot of people don't understand that with, at SPG in particular, that's kind of our thing, is when we say we stick to fundamentals, everybody goes, oh, that's so restricted. You guys don't know. It's actually the opposite. You guys are doing paint by numbers. I'm teaching people the mechanics of painting, giving them a canvas, and they'll go paint your painting. And it's actually a faster process, I think, the way we do it. Um, so that's my answer. I think, I, I like Eddie, and I like, Kyle Terry is obviously awesome. Yeah. We'll talk about uh, Kent Planet for a second. He's teaching the style. So, you know, I, I would just I'd tell Eddie, you know, I don't think you're teaching necessarily Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You're teaching a style of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. His, his Jiu Jitsu, right? Which is cool, but it's not what I, I want to do. I want to teach the art and let other people develop the style. Anything else? Cool. Thank you very much.